All right then. This is the Russian Tale of the Triplets, part two. Uh, I guess there's a few of you who have just come in and sort of missed part one, but uh, a brief recap. This is about three identical triplet brothers, each of which who has been granted some very unusual powers by the wee folk. Um, we already covered Swiftfoot, who went out gathering horses for the Emperor of China. Now the second brother, who went to the south, was Cleverhand. And he traveled for several days, and he woke up one morning hearing this commotion in the distance, and following it, he came to a large group gathered beneath the walls of a castle, and there was a great amount of, of activity going on, and people working, and, and there was hammering and sawing and, and all sorts of noise. And he found someone who looked like they were perhaps in charge and said, what is going on here? And the man told him that our Duke has called us to war to go fight raiders from the south. And we are desperately trying to get our army equipped and supplied so we can march south as soon as possible. And Clever Hand said, could you use some help with this? And of course, the man told him that, that well, anything that you could do uh, would be certainly rewarded. What can you do? And Clever Hand thought for a moment. He says, well, let's see. And he began by walking over to where the blacksmiths were working. And he picked up a hammer and a bar of iron. And he held it in his hands for a few moments and immediately starts setting to work pounding and hammering and, and, and sticking it in and out of the coals. And by the end of the day, he had formed two dozen perfect spear points. And now he went away and rested. And he woke up the second morning, and he went to where the woodworkers were all working feverishly. And he picked up a shaving tool and he held it in his hand for a few moments. And then he picked up some tree, some tree limbs and began working feverishly at it. By the end of the day, he had created two dozen spear shafts to go with the spear points he had, had created the day before. And again, he went to sleep and rested for a while. On the third day, he woke up and he walked over there were the cloth makers and, and uh, weavers were working. And he picked up a shears and a needle and he held them in his hands for a few moments. Who's responsible for this? And everyone turned around and pointed to Clever Hand. And the Duke said to Clever Hand, this is quite remarkable what you can do. Would you be willing to join us at our war? And Clever Hand said, well, I am afraid not, for I have had my adventure now, and I have promised to go back and care for my parents in their old age, but I would appreciate some payment for my work. And the Duke graciously handed him a bag filled with gold coins. And now Clever Hand headed home. Which brings us to the third and perhaps most interesting adventure of all, and that is of Keen Eye who had headed off to the west. And after many days of travel to desert lands, he came to a great walled city ruled by a sultan. And this city seemed to be in somewhat of a state of turmoil because much of the sultan's wealth and power rested upon a tree which grew in the sultan's garden. This was no ordinary tree. This tree produced, of all things, apples of solid gold. Why were they concerned? Because over the past many days, the apples had been mysteriously vanishing, and no one could seem to explain why. So Clever Hand went before the Sultan and said, would you allow me to take up uh, a post in your garden and watch closely? Perhaps I can solve this mystery for you. So the Sultan granted him this permission. And so now Clever Hand, I'm sorry, Keen Eye, went out into the garden 
and he climbed a different tree, laid himself out in the branch, laid there quietly where he could watch the uh, tree of golden apples, which of course was surrounded by fierce looking guardsmen. And as evening fell, he saw a small butterfly come flittering into the garden and it landed on one of the apples and stayed there, slowly moving its wings back and forth. And as evening turned into darkness, the little butterfly suddenly turned into a funny looking little man in a dark cloak who seized the apple and sprang off over the wall and, and away into the darkness. Hmm, said, but said uh, Keen Eye. There's something I'd never seen before. And the next morning, of course, when it was sh when the count was taken and it was shown one of the apples was again missing, the sultan was, well, somewhat furious. And he stated that, I begin to suspect that my guardsmen are in on this thievery. Perhaps I should have them all beheaded and replace more honest men. And now Kenai stepped forth and said, uh, Great Sultan, I do not believe that your guardsmen are at fault. Allow me to stay one more night in your garden, and I believe I can explain what is going on. And the Sultan grudgingly granted him permission, but then added, Very well, but if come morning and another of my golden apples are missing, your head will join theirs on the pile. So, Kenai left the court of the Sultan and he went out into the city, into the great marketplace. And there he obtained a net, a casting net of the type used for fishing in shallow water, perhaps a few spans wide with weights around the edge. He folded it up carefully, took it back to the palace, laid down for, for some rest, leaving very precise instructions that he be awoken well before sunset. When they awakened him, he again went out into the garden, tucked the net carefully within his blouse, climbed up onto the tree, laid himself over the branch, and stayed there quietly and watched. And sure enough, as the sun started setting, again the little butterfly came, and it landed on one of the golden apples and just sat there. And as sunset turned into darkness, again, the butterfly suddenly changed into this strange little dark cloaked man who seized the apple and leapt off into the darkness. But at that moment, Keen Eye dropped down out of the tree, drew forth the net, and threw it across the intervening space, snagging the little man out of the air and sending him crashing to the ground where he was at once set upon by the guards and dragged in before the Sultan. Now, at first, this man loudly proclaimed his innocence of, of any wrongdoing, despite the fact that he had been caught literally with the stolen goods in his hand. And when this was pointed out, he now changed his story, claiming that he had been put under a spell by an evil sorcerer and compelled to do such thievery. Well, the Sultan did not believe this story either. And when the man's feet were then held to hot coals, he at last admitted that he himself was a sorcerer who had studied the dark arts and chose to use them to support himself through, well, such acts of thievery. With only a slightly greater amount of persuasion, the man was encouraged to tell where he had been stowing all of his stolen goods. And when the guardsmen went there, they found not only the stolen apples, but a fair number of other valuable items which had been disappearing all around the city. When this was brought back to the Sultan, he commanded that the little man be placed in chains of cold iron, which were proof against all forms of sorcery and magic, taken down to his dungeon, and the next day he would be taken out to the city square at noontime and there beheaded before the populace for his crimes. He then turned to Kenai and said, tell me, would you be willing to stay here and join me as a member of my court? You have talents I would find useful. And as his two brothers before him, 
Kenai bowed and says, Your Majesty, I am honored by your offer, but I have promised that I will, once I have had my adventures and earned some monies, I will go home and support my parents in their old age, and I cannot break this out. And the Sultan nodded in understanding, and he gave to Kenai two of the golden apples, each of which was worth a small fortune. And so Kenai left the Sultan's palace, headed back across the, the desert to join his two brothers at home, where with the wealth they had gathered between them, their parents no longer needed to engage in hard labor and lived in pleasant uh, retirement for the rest of their lives. Now that is the first half of the story of the Russian triplets. The second half is the story of the final adventure they had together. And that will wait for the next round. If I'm still here. Otherwise, <laughs> tomorrow night. <laughs>